Hello and welcome to another season here at Scouching. Now, usually when we start a whole new season's worth of videos here, we like to look at NHL rookies and look at how they're transitioning into the NHL game. Now, there hasn't been an NHL season so far, obviously, so there's no rookies that are playing in the NHL just yet, but we'll get to those at some point. And just the same as last year and the year before, I like to recap it here on the channel. So usually when I cap off a team, I award my most valuable player, but I think this year I'm going to change things up a little bit. And I'm going to switch over to something that I'm going to call MPS, which stands for Most Pleasant Surprise. I think it's important to look at the World Juniors through the lens of just sitting back and watching the guys play and going, huh, look what he can do. So the first team's tournament we're going to look at is the Austrians. Now, I'm not really sure what you can say. They were outworked, they were outmatched, and they were just likely to be relegated had this been a regular standard World Junior Hockey tournament. But Lukas Ranischitz was clearly the story of the tournament for that team, facing an unbelievable workload, and every once in a while you get a goaltender playing on an underdog team that just faces an astounding amount of pucks. And in that kind of a workload, you're bound to be impressed. So I have to give a lot of credit to Luka Ranischitz for the performance that he put up for the Austrian team in the very least. And I know some people have a bit of concern based on Marco Rossi not really being able to quarterback this Austrian team to any level of success. But this is a great example of there just being only so much that one player can do on a team that just is not on the same level. I thought Marco Rossi was remarkably active away from the puck, considering how often Austria did not have the puck. There were some moments where he was sending pucks out in front from along the boards, which is something he did all the time with the Ottawa 67s last year, but there just wasn't enough pressure on the net to put those pucks in the net. Senna Peters was the only player on this team who scored a goal, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't expect to see a little bit more out of Marco Rossi in this tournament, but again, I can't really fault him considering the team that was around him. And to boot, the Austrians were missing who would have certainly been their best defenseman in Timo Nickel. When you do not have a defenseman who's able to use the puck and get it to their forwards up in the neutral zone and create offensive rushes on a consistent basis, it creates a lot of difficulty when it comes to generating offensive rushes and generating offense from them. So now you look towards next year, and unfortunately the Austrians are losing Marco Rossi, and there isn't really a ton of talent coming down the pipe for the Austrians. I thought Marcus Kasper looked pretty solid, especially for a player not draft eligible until 2022. Timo Nickel is also ineligible for next year's tournament, so the premier player for the Austrians next year will likely be Senna Peters. And if Senna Peters is your premier talent for a World Junior Hockey tournament, I just can't really see a situation where you're not going to be fighting for relegation next season. So my most pleasant surprise for the Austrians this year was Senna Peters. I certainly didn't think that he was going to be the only player on this team to score a goal at all in this year's tournament, and I thought that for a power winger he showed a lot of drive and determination around the net, with some nice finesse in rushes as well, and really worked with Marco Rossi quite well to at least try to generate something. And I wasn't really impressed with him last year a whole lot outside of the odd power move to cut to the net with the puck and the odd goal scoring instinct that he showed, but he certainly showed that his game is developing as a bit more of that power winger type player, so I'm curious to see where his career goes from here, especially if he does return for next year's tournament. Next we go to the Swiss, and honestly this year I wasn't expecting a whole lot, especially when you look at the fire power that the Germans had access to this season. And whenever I watched the Swiss team this year, I just felt that they were outmatched in almost every single game they played, just barely clinging to life far too often. However, with strong returning names like Meyer, Kananika, Kanak, Helamont, Chianton, and Biasca, the Swiss should at least be able to avoid relegation if they end up there against likely the Austrians. But I felt this team lacked the speed that a lot of other teams in this year's tournament had, the aggression with the puck, the ability to cut into the dangerous areas of the ice and really challenge their opponents consistently. In the past, the Swiss team has been successful off of playing a very similar game to teams like the Czech Republic and Slovakia, where they play hard for a full 60 minutes and just grind the opposing teams down and eke out wins here and there. They had a lot of trouble moving pucks as a functional unit. I felt their lack of depth really exposed itself over the course of this tournament. And when I look at next year's potential roster for the Swiss and what might be coming that wasn't in this year's tournament, I don't really see very much of these high-end offensive players that countries like Slovakia and the Czech Republic seem to be slowly developing more of in recent years. And honestly, I don't know where the Swiss junior team in general is going to be in a few years, but if there's any team in this year's tournament that gave me the thought that they might be on a bit of a decline for the next couple of seasons, it was the Swiss team. All of this being said, my most pleasant surprise this year was Giancarlo Shanton. I saw a bit of him with the Niagara Ice Dogs last year, and that team 
wasn't great, and it's kind of hard to identify a really good defenseman on a team where they just are not great. But I thought Shanton was one of the more careful, puck-controlling defensemen that the Swiss had this year. But I look at Shanton's intelligence and calm maintenance of the puck with decent side-to-side -side and backwards mobility, and he's one that I'm certainly going to need to circle back on this season in the coming weeks. Next, we're going to move to the German team, and honestly, what more can you say? Just an unbelievable overall effort and a remarkable story to take away from this year's World Junior Tournament. This whole program was ravaged with coronavirus quarantines. They played almost half of a team for the first couple of games of this tournament. And the fact that that team laced up the skates with 14 skaters and played a team like Canada and also managed to score a couple of goals on them is just remarkable. And while they got dismantled in the early days of the tournament when they were shorthanded, they managed to meet their goal and get themselves to the quarterfinal. Again, an unbelievable achievement. They certainly had exciting, high-end, high-octane offense on their top unit, and I hope that names like Tim Stutzla and John Jason Paterka, among others, can have the excitement of the sport trickle down to the youth in Germany. And on that note, Tim Stutzla, excuse me, <laughs> Tim Stutzla was electrifying in this tournament, and certainly the ups and downs of his game were on display here. The dual threat offense and the skill is phenomenal. You can see it on the ice almost every time he steps on the ice and gets the puck on his stick. However, the concerns are there isn't much dynamic pace to his game. He's just in go mode all of the time. And when you're faced with significant defensive pressure in the pros, I think it remains to be seen as to how much things will translate. But again, certainly a player that I very, very much have enjoyed watching in this year's tournament and enjoyed watching last season. So much so that my friend Josh Tesler brought me this jersey back from traveling to Germany, which is a thing that you could do at some point. Stutzler showed that he has all the potential in the world to be a tremendous offensive winger down the road in the National Hockey League. But since that was the expectation coming into the tournament for him, my most pleasant surprise was John Jason Paterka. I am amazed that more Buffalo Sabres fans are not just pummeling the internet with takes about how he's this extremely undervalued prospect they got way too late in the draft. And to me, it's already kind of clear that he did go a little bit later in the draft than he should. He looked fantastic in this tournament. I thought he was just as much of a driver of his team's success, at least in terms of transition play, as Tim Stutzla was. But again, small sample sizes in this tournament, and you kind of have to be patient. So the same skill level and potential upside might not be there with a player like John Jason Paterka as his teammate Tim Stutzla, but as was the case in my tracking work last year between both players, he had better transition numbers than Tim Stutzla did, and he was driving a lot of pucks into the offensive zone with control constantly. And I thought Paterka showed great initiative away from the puck to at least keep Germany afloat when they needed it. And especially in the early days of the tournament, they needed that a lot. And if he is back next year, even without Tim Stutzla, I imagine him and Lukas Reichel will certainly do their part to try and push the Germans back into the quarterfinals in 2022. Next we go to Slovakia. Overall, I liked the Slovakians tournament when all things were being considered. There are many shot metrics I found that really told a different tale with the Slovakian team this year. And even though they just barely won a game in this year's tournament, I thought they battled extremely hard against Canada to at least keep the game close and at least scored two goals on the eventual gold medal winning team in the United States. They were also the youngest team in this tournament, and I felt their younger players were some of the best players on their team, or at least the most promising. And being able to bring back Simon Lakatsi last year, if he brings the same magic he did this year, should at least help Slovakia stay afloat again. Names like Samuel Knazko and Martin Kromiak had their ups and downs in the reports I put together on them last year, and similar to Tim Stutzla, they were on display as well, but luckily both of those names will be able to return along with their really strong core of youth, like Simon Nemec, Alexei Mikluka, Philip Meshar, and their most pleasant surprise for me this season, and that would be Yuri Slavkovsky. With Slavkovsky, I've seen him play with TPS's junior program here and there over the last couple of seasons, and he's looked great at the finish under 20 level so far, or at least very promising. And in this year's World Junior Tournament, I thought he showed tremendous potential with his frame, 
his skating, his power game, and his play along the boards. There's agility. Moving up the ice, he shows a lot of strength and resiliency with the puck on his stick. There's creative playmaking offensively, especially below the goal line. And I thought he showed a decent goal-scoring instinct around the net that he wasn't really rewarded for this season. But overall, I just came away really impressed with his first under-20 competition, and he certainly showed why he's such a promising player for the Slovakian program moving forward. Next, we're going to take a look at the Czech Republic, and this is another one of those teams where you just have to give them credit. They played hard and they battled in almost every single game that I watched, and similar to Slovakia, they kept a game against Canada a bit hair-raisingly close, and similar to Slovakia, the promising part of their roster was their youngest pieces. Jan Mišák, Pavel Novak, and Stanislav Fozil are all pieces that should be back next season for this team, I thought Adam Raska certainly filled a role for this team, and he certainly fit that role for better or worse, and there's certainly more coming down the pipe for this team for next year's tournament. Guys like Martin Rishavi, Yuri Tihacek, Jakub Brabonets, and a whole bunch of other names coming out of the Czech Republic that just didn't make this team that should help keep the Czech Republic competitive. But the most pleasant surprise for me on this team was David Juracek. I've seen him play a little bit over the course of this season in the Czech Republic, and every single time, he has looked outstanding. This is a player that, to me, should be a player in first-round consideration for the 2022 NHL Draft, and he certainly showed why in this year's tournament. His skating, his skill, his ability to control the offensive zone from the blue line, it's all just really, really high-end for a player his age, and he's playing against men right now. While it doesn't seem like he's going to be coming to Spokane this year, I hope that for next year he does make the jump, because I am fascinated to see what he's capable of on North American ice if his performance in Edmonton translates to the WHL. And according to the data on Instat, he was absolutely light years ahead of his teammates in terms of shot attempt possession rates, with great passing metrics and breakout metrics from the defensive zone, as well as good entry statistics into the offensive zone. And for a 2022 eligible defender on the Czech Republic team to pull all of this off at once is simply outstanding. So I'm really excited to see what Juracek's future looks like in the coming years. All right, now we go to the Swedes, and some people are disappointed disappointed with the Swedish team and some of the individuals on the team for the performance they put up this year. And in my opinion, I just kind of feel bad. The coronavirus pandemic hit this team hard. They were missing some seriously high-end potential players that could have really helped this team generate more offense. I thought they deserved a better fate, but that's not really a surprise in this tournament. Sometimes unfair things happen in this tournament to any country. However, I will say that it felt kind of weird to see Jesper Volstead sitting on the bench for so long, especially when he did come in to replace Hugo Alnefeld and looked really solid in the Swedish net. I mean, to me, that guy is just a robot when it comes to stopping pucks, and he would have been the goalie that I leaned into this year. The Swedes just barely missed out on winning their quarterfinal against Finland, and overall, like I said, I just came away feeling kind of bad. On the plus side, I thought Lucas Raymond looked outstanding from start to finish. He showed exactly why he is such a highly rated prospect. With and without the puck, he plays with relentless intelligence. He knows what needs to be done at any given moment, he can play at a highly dynamic pace of play, and he was driving a tremendous amount of offense for the Swedish team this season. Alexander Holtz, I know some people are a little bit concerned with his tournament, but if a couple of shots of his were just three inches in a different direction, he would have had quite a lot of goals added to his totals. And I thought Teddy Niederbach, Elmer Soderblom, and Emil Heinemann also brought some really nice auxiliary talent to this tournament. Elmer Soderblom certainly put his skill on display, and Emil Heinemann, as he was last year, was just skating around the ice trying to crush absolutely everything and jam pucks into the net. And there's lots of time for players like that in the National Hockey League. The downside, though, is their entire defense group outside of Emil Andre is not eligible for next year's tournament. However, there are names like William Valinder, Helge Granz, Simon Edvinson, Anton Johannesson, and even 2022 eligible defensemen like Elias Salomonsson, who are all available for the Swedish team next year. So I don't really think that their defense group is going to be noticeably weaker than next year, but without names like Tobias Bjornfot, Victor Soderstrom, and a healthy Philip Broberg, it might be a bit of an adjustment for the Swedes with an entirely new defense group coming next season. But my most pleasant surprise for the Swedes this year was Noel Gundler. I have had a bit of concern about Noel Gundler's inconsistency last year, but through it all, his results were still great. He's a tremendous goal scorer, and that was put on display in this year's tournament, and I felt that this was a bit of a coming out party 
in the sense that people were down on Noel Gundler for a bit of the wrong reasons. His offensive ability just can't be denied, but his overall possession numbers were some of the best on the Swedish team this year. He scored goals that just got you out of your seat if you were permitted to attend the game in person. And he certainly showed that as a complementary offensive piece, he is more than capable of managing to get the puck in the net one way or the other. Whether it's through his shot first, which was electrifying in this tournament, or by moving pucks around the offensive zone, which I think he showed a solid capability of doing. So to me, I think the Carolina Hurricanes landed themselves yet another pretty solid prospect at a pick way later than he should have gone. Okay, now we're gonna get into the medal round here and look at the Russians. And I can't say this team didn't underperform my expectation. I think Ray Ferraro nailed it when he said there was a bit of a philosophical mismatch between what Igor Larionov, a rookie coach in this tournament, was looking for out of these players, especially relative to how a lot of these players play in Russia. And if there's a mismatch between how your coach wants you to play in a limited sample tournament and how you play back home, there can be some serious problems that translate onto the ice, and I think those were on display for the Russians. They had skill and speed in their roster, but they weren't really attacking the middle of the ice a tremendous amount, and I felt that they were relying on dump and chase hockey far too often, especially relative to what Igor Larionov seemed to want out of them. And when they played the style that Igor Larionov wanted, it was almost too far in the other direction, and they weren't really attacking anything. The team felt disjointed, they barely escaped their quarterfinal win, they got dismantled by the Canadians and couldn't close out the bronze medal to a team that just seemed to outwork everyone they played in the team from Finland. But I felt that the Russians had a few bright individual performances in this year's tournament. Guys like Rodion Amirov, Vasily Podkolzin, especially Vasily Ponomaryov, Arseny Gritsyuk, and even at times Marat Kuznodinov, I thought showed really promising potential with their offensive talent and speed and skill. But as a functional unit that drove deep into the offensive zone and drove strong possession metrics that could keep up with the best teams like Canada and the United States, the Russians just fell short. But I'll also say that I hope this isn't the last we see of Igor Larionov. I don't know what's in store for the Russians between now and next season, but I hope that the talk that Igor Larionov talks starts to get picked up more and more by these younger players in Russia over the next season, so that next year they come back much more prepared. Because this team also has the potential of adding some really fun, electrifying, possession-first offensive talent. Marat Kuznodinov, Yaroslav Askarov, Daniil Cheka, Shakir Muhammadulin, Vasily Ponomaryov are all names that should be back next season for this team, but you've also got names like Alexander Pashin, Daniil Guschin, Dmitry Ovchinikov, Nikita Chibrikov, and even adding a defenseman like Artyom Grushnikov next year should be able to keep the Russians in medal conversations for next season's tournament. And I think all of those names should get long looks to make this team next year, because I think that they would help Larionov walk the walk that he talks. But my most pleasant surprise this year for the Russians was Semyon Chistikov. Now this is a player who, when he was draft eligible, I thought, he's a defenseman who plays in Russia, but he can skate really well, so he's probably worth drafting and seeing what happens in the mid-rounds. And the Nashville Predators, who love to draft those type of defensemen, picked him up in the mid-rounds, and he's come along really nicely. I thought he showed creativity with the puck in all three zones, able to open up passing lanes to the defensive zone, navigate through the new neutral zone with control of the puck, and move pucks up from the blue line in the offensive zone with skill and aggression really effectively. All of these things in conjunction were all really promising to see out of Chistyakov. And I think there's a lot to like with Chistyakov's overall package of talents, and I'm really curious to see what the Predators can do with him if he ever comes over to North America. Okay, so our first medal winner of the tournament was the Finns. Now, the term grit makes my skin crawl, but this team certainly had grit in spades. They fought and battled their way to the bronze medal game, and they fought and battled their way to winning the bronze medal game. If anyone earned their medal in this year's tournament, it was the Finns. Anton Lindell has come a step in his offensive generation for sure. He's able to produce offensive production more consistently, and that was on display in this year's tournament. Ronnie Hirvonen's no-nonsense offensive game was on full display, and the physical strength in the depth of the Finnish roster this year certainly battled hard and tread water throughout the entire tournament and earned themselves a bronze medal. Their defense had excellent two-way mobility, led by names like Vili Heinola, Topi Nimala, Emil Viro, and even Santori and with names like Brad Lambert, Samuel Hellenius, Atu Ratu, Samu Tuomala, Samu Salmanen, and other interesting options that are 2021 and 2022 draft eligible, Finland should be a competitive team next year as well, even if they're losing some premier offensive talent. And my most pleasant surprise this year was Topi Nimala. 
Now, when you have a young player who's playing against men going back to junior, you should expect things to look a little bit easier for them. But Nimala showed to me that he was a calm, smooth skating defenseman who put his skill on display with strong puck possession ability and strong puck management. And through that, the production just kind of created itself. He was a rock solid transition player going both directions in the Liga for a draft eligible player, and all of that is really promising. And he brought that side of his game to this tournament and was rewarded for it. So while I'm not surprised that his pro experience led to a pretty solid world junior, I am surprised at just how impressive I found him this year. Him and Vili Hainala, I thought, provided a strong foundation for their team's defense, and I think he's another player similar to John Jason Paterka, who I think you can already tell was drafted a little bit too late. Next, we go to the silver medal winners, and my home country, the Canadians. Now, historically with Canadian World Junior teams, the biggest question marks are goaltending and discipline. And this year, you cannot say that those things were issues. The Canadian team just put on a clinic in just win hockey. They didn't blow out every single team that they played, but they won every game until the end of the tournament and never felt like they were completely out of control of the game at any point until the gold medal game. They were pushed by other teams, but they never broke until they were faced with the ferocity of that United States team this year. Now, there was a lot of chip and chase hockey from the Canadians this year, which can function against slower teams, but against teams like the United States, I'm not surprised Canada had trouble generating offense. There was also a lot of overthinking offensive plays and not just taking the chances that presented themselves, but Canada still fought to the bitter end and should still be an extremely exciting team for next year. A name like Quentin Byfield I felt got better as the tournament went on, and the final play that he made in his tournament was that rush up the ice where he sent Drew Hellison straight through the crust of the earth directly into the mantle. But I can't really recall a number of times where Quentin Byfield got a defenseman to hand him the puck in the defensive zone and he just went up the ice with control of the puck. He was more of an away from the puck, aggressive physical force that was trying to free up pucks, which is not really what I found to be the biggest strengths of his game last year. There were flashes of what Quinton Byfield is capable of down the road, and he is a player where you're betting on his potential, but I think patience will remain necessary. And if he is back in next year's tournament, he will be a premier player. Keep in mind, he was the youngest player on this year's Team Canada. And on that note, there are only five names on the Canadian roster this season that are eligible to return next year. But the names that just didn't get an invite this year are not that much of a step back. Hendricks Lapierre, Seth Jarvis, Brant Clark, Jacob Perrault, Maverick Bork, Ozzy Wiesblatt, even Owen Power and Ryan O'Rourke, there's all kinds of names that didn't make this year's roster that should be there next year that should do more than enough to keep Canada in the medal conversation. And my most pleasant surprise on Canada this year is a little tough because all of these players are extremely impressive on their own, but I'm going to put Cole Perfetti's name out there. I thought the concerns with his skating last year were a little bit overblown, especially when you look at his intelligence and skill, but his skating has come at least a step since the end of the OHL season. He seemed far more agile and comfortable on his feet, whether it was moving up the middle with control or moving up the boards with control of the puck, and he was directing play from the boards and making plays very well. So if he's back next year, I imagine he's a guy who's going to be in the driver's seat along with a name like Quinton Byfield in that Dylan Cousins, Kirby Doc style role. So with another year of development, I'm certainly excited to see what Cole Perfetti can do, because of everyone on this Canadian team, I was most surprised by him. Oh, and one more thing, and this is just my opinion, but I think Canada should probably stop putting gold on their jerseys. If there's ever a sign that you want to motivate other teams to beat you even more, you don't put the championship color on your jersey, especially go out of your way to put gold on your jersey. And this jersey would probably also look better just in red and white, if I'm being honest. Finally, we go to the gold medal winning team in this year's tournament, the United States of America. Now, I was kind of surprised to find out after the tournament that there were people out there calling the United States underdogs, and who, why, how, when, like, what? The United States NTDP for a number of years now has had some unbelievable rosters and they're trained to play together very, very well. Anyone underestimating any US team anymore is certainly not seeing the forest through the trees. The states are a legitimate hockey powerhouse, especially at the junior level, and this tournament, for all of the doubters, was an exclamation point. The speed, the creativity, the diversity of offensive talent throughout their entire lineup 
the relentless work ethic in all three zones. They just put on an absolute clinic in modern speed, possession, and skill-based hockey. They shut down Canada when it mattered the most, Spencer Knight was spectacular when he needed to be, and almost from top to bottom, the Americans simply looked dominant. And while just six names are eligible for next year's roster, a lot of those names were standouts in this year's tournament. Guys like Jake Sanderson and Brock Faber are rock-solid defensemen who are on their way back likely next season, and Brett Berard, who was extremely impressive, is also likely to come back next year. Plus, there's also more on the way that should help this U.S. team stay in contention for quite a while. But my most pleasant surprise for the U.S. team this year is Matthew Beniers. Now, he is the Michigan guy that I was highest on going into this tournament, and if you're in my Discord server, you will certainly know why. But he certainly solidified my view that Matthew Beniers years is at the very least a top five player for this year's NHL draft. He was one of the most dominant transition players on any team in the entire tournament, and he did it while playing for the United States team. And if he can gain a little bit more control of his game, especially when he's really trucking up the ice, and work on his posture a little bit to keep the puck a little bit closer to his body more often rather than keeping it so far in front of him, and a bit more dynamic vision in the offensive zone to be a more effective playmaker, he could be a truly just great hockey player. And this to me was a coming out party for Beniers, and I will certainly join up on any hype train that's out there for this kid. So some overall thoughts before we go. I thought this was another fantastic installment of a fantastic tournament. Congratulations to that US team for pulling off what they pulled off and how they did it. They were one of the most fun teams I've seen play in quite a while. The Czechs, the Slovaks, and the Finns all grinded the most possible talent out of the rosters that they brought. I thought the Canadians put on a clinic in terms of structured and organized hockey, and the United States put an exclamation mark on the world stage for their junior development talent. USA Hockey has a remarkable national team development program, and while I would consider the 2021 class to be Fine. The 2022 and even 2023 names that are on the way for Team USA look great. But most of all, I think we need to recognize the German program. They were missing some of their highest of high-end players for this entire tournament, and missed almost half of their team for the first few games. And landing a quarter-final appearance after all of that is amazing. And while this might be a golden generation for German players, I do really hope that there is a trickle-down effect into hockey in Germany. The Germans were relegated, promoted, or saved in relegation from the World Juniors in every single year from 2002 until they were relegated in 2015. They bottomed out in 2016 with just two wins in the Division 1A tournament, in real danger of being relegated to Division 1B. But after three years of mediocrity at the Division 1A level, they have made their mark with this group, and I think this tournament is an exclamation point on that narrative. So regardless of what happens next year with the German group that should still be relatively strong, they really deserve all the pats on the back for a heck of a few years for this program, and we are all better for it. So before I go, I want to do two things. First off, I want to reiterate that in my 2020 video recap, I said that it would be really interesting to have the women's under-18 tournament coincide with the men's under-20 tournament so that we can give some more exposure to women's hockey. Now obviously the pandemic has occurred in the time being, and the women's under-18 tournament has been, I believe, cancelled, but it should be something that in my opinion we push for for 2022. Last year's gold medal game ended with 10,000 people watching a live stream on a website called Livestream.com, and, th and those hockey games were almost all close and exciting. So I think that if we put some resources behind the women's under-18 tournament, we could have some exciting hockey narratives come out of that tournament as well, just like we do with the Young Men's Tournament. And before I go, I want to award my all-tournament team. And just like Brian Burke's hockey teams, we're going to start from the net out. And we're going to start in net with Spencer Knight. I thought that he was the best goaltender wire-to-wire -wire in this year's tournament. Outside of that first game against the Russians, I thought he shut the door extremely well, especially when it mattered the most. There were some moments in that Canadian gold medal game where I was convinced the puck was going to go in the net, and somehow that guy stopped the puck. I thought Devin Levi was extremely impressive. When Yaroslav Askarov was not playing the Canadians, I thought he looked pretty good too. But Spencer Knight made it count, and he won himself a gold medal. On defense, I'm going to award it to Topi Nimala and Bowen Byram. I thought Bowen Byram looked spectacularly good. I think a lot of the people who were questioning him based on his production last year should feel a little bit better after having seen him in this year's tournament. 
the skating, the puck control, the distribution, and the vision were all on display in all zones of the ice. And I think that there's an extremely bright defense prospect there for the Colorado Avalanche, as if they need any more. With Topi Nimala, I felt that he looked calm, composed, but mobile and aggressive with the puck. Really good puck distribution, solid transition numbers, and just seemed to control play for the Finnish team extremely well. And up front, I have to give the all-tournament awards to Trevor Zegras, Tim Stutzla, and Anton Lindell. Trevor Zegras is a wizard. I don't know how much of his offense is going to translate to the National Hockey League, but honestly, after watching him play in two World Juniors now and a bunch of times watching him play in Junior, I don't really care. He is so much fun to watch, and I think he could be a great NHL hockey player. Tim Stutzla, more along the same lines. He's an aggressive offensive winger with skill on skill on skill. I think the potential for him is almost limitless, and he certainly put that on display in this year's tournament just like he did last year. And Anton Lundell showed that the concerns about his offense might be a little bit overblown. He was driving deep into the offensive zone, driving to dangerous areas, distributing the puck in the offensive zone really well, and also falling back on his intelligence to just drive play extremely well. I think the Florida Panthers got him way too late in the draft this year, and this World Junior certainly cemented that opinion. So with that, we've reached the end of the World Junior Hockey Recap for 2021. I want to wish you all a very happy new year, even though it's a couple of weeks late. Once the NHL season starts, you can look for NHL rookie recaps, and once we get into March and April is when the scheduling reports will start to flow. So that's it, and thanks for watching. If you liked it, you can click all the buttons you see below me so you never miss another one. If you really liked it, you could subscribe here on YouTube through my membership program or on Patreon. You'll get access to a Discord server, early access to all my videos and work, data visualizations, data sheets for hundreds of drafted and undrafted prospects, as well as plenty of other goodies. Or you can pick up some merchandise from the Scouchware shop where all the links are in the description below and 50% of profits go to the Women's Sports Foundation. So that's all and we'll see you in the next one.